My name is Dylan Mohan Gray. I'm from Mumbai, India. And my film is called Fire in the Blood. It's screening at the Sundance Film Festival in the World Cinema Documentary Competition. You can, you can talk to me. Okay. Um, you're, it's a very powerful film about, for me, about capitalism. Although in the Q&A last night, you sort of said it's not about capitalism. And, and I, I wondered why you said that when I heard it all about profit control, uh, putting people, profit before people. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, uh, you're right, it is about capitalism, but it's not about free market capitalism. It's about a perverse, it's about a perversion of the capitalist ideal, which one may or may not subscribe to, uh, of free market competition, supply and demand. Uh, because what we have here, in the case of pharmaceuticals, uh, is a monopoly situation whereby uh, large corporations are able to essentially purchase research uh, either from academic institutions or from small biotech companies or other small uh, innovators and uh, take out a patent monopoly on that innovation, uh, allowing them to charge whatever they want for the end product. So. I always find it a little bit amusing when people say, well, that's just our capitalist system, because monopoly is actually a government granted, uh, it's a government grant of exclusivity. And, you know, there's nothing to do with free market competition. Wherever there's been free market competition for pharmaceuticals, prices have fallen very, very low. Which is why, for example, in India, where you had a patent regime for 40 years, which basically disallowed monopolies on essential medicine, you have the most that's affordable dis medicine in the world. Disallowed uh, patterns on essential medicine. So, so what you had in India, according to the Patent Act of 1970 in India, you could only have process patents, not a product patent. The difference is this. The end product uh, cannot be patented. Only the process by which you make that. So if you reverse engineer a molecule and you come up with the same molecule at the end, uh, you get the, the, you don't think the company that had the patent can only patent the, the earlier process. So you're free to make that drug. If you can, make it by another process uh, and have an equivalent, uh, bioequivalent end product. I'm using this interview in the context of the piece that I'm writing. So this will be dropped in on, on the digital version. And I will have explained about the film, etc. So I just want to make sure you just started off with talking about capitalism. One of the things that, that just was so powerful for me, I'd never heard of trips. Never heard of it. And, and I'm going to tell you how I heard it in the film, and you can correct me. Trips was how the pharmaceutical, multinational pharmaceutical companies took back control over individual countries' ability to have patent free medicine or to have generic medicine. They took back the control, they lost it on the AIDS drugs, the, first, the, the, the front line of the AIDS drugs in, in a particular period. But as I understand from your film, this will not hold for future drugs and trips has been put in place by the World Trade Association, is that who did it? So basically, the TRIPS agreement, TRIPS stands for uh, Trade Related Intellectual Property. Uh, intellectual Property? Trade Related Intellectual Property, TRIPS. Uh, TRIPS agreement is part of the World Trade Organization, WTO, uh, which is essentially a Western controlled uh, organization, but most of the countries of the world belong to it. Certainly all the economically active countries of the world belong to it. Uh, and what you had in the case of TRIPS, uh, interesting, one of the characters in our film, Joseph Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winning economist, will tell you right away, they call it trade related, but it's not trade related. Actually, intellectual property uh, disputes have their own organization, international organization called WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, also based in Geneva. So why, you may ask, is TRIPS in the WTO and not in WIPO? The reason for that is because WIPO doesn't have the sanctioning power that the WTO has. So even if WIPO wants to sanction somebody, they don't have the sledgehammer to force their will on countries like the WTO does. In essence, what will TRIPS do in the future in relation to generic and cheap drugs? So the reason why uh, giant uh, 
intellectual property based industries forced through trips. And when I say giant intellectual property based industries, I mean primarily the pharmaceutical industry. But in addition, the entertainment industry, the video gaming industry, the publishing industry, you know, what has happened is that the rich world has basically stopped manufacturing things. Because they found it's cheaper in the process of globalization to let poor people make their products. Now the only fear they have is that they will lose control of those products by allowing poor people to make them in places like China. So all they really have left is so-called intellectual property. And what TRIPS attempts to do is to impose a Western-style intellectual property regimen on all the countries of the world, especially those they fear the most, being China in the first instance and India in the second. So uh, essentially what they're trying to do is take an American, Western-style, very pro-corporate intellectual property regime and make it universal throughout the world. Because until now, patents and trademark and copyright and other forms of intellectual property have been national laws based on the national interests of every single individual country. Therefore, they were different and they could be different in different countries. Certainly. And as I understand, TRIPS is imposing one template on That's everybody. Right. That's correct. So, for example, in 1970, India had some of the highest drug prices in the world. And the government of Indira Gandhi decided at that time, this is crazy, we have a country where a large chunk of the population is illiterate, many are now malnourished, you know, there's intense, massive poverty in our country. We cannot afford monopolies on life-saving medicine and on food. And essentially what they did is they pushed through the patent law of 1970 and the situation in India changed virtually overnight. That was a law that was undertaken in the Indian national interest. Unfortunately, the Western governments forced India to abrogate that law in 2005, so now they have a TRIPS-compliant patent law in India, uh, which, and the repercussions are now starting to be felt by, by what, consumers what in India. The, there's a couple of real heroes in your film, yes. Peter and the Indian pharmaceutical manufacturer. Can you talk a little bit about each of them? Yeah, so I think we have a good, uh, a solid handful of great heroes in our film. Uh, two of them, those you mentioned, are Dr. Peter Mojani, who was with us at our first two screenings here at Sundance. He's come from uh, from Kampala in Uganda. He is the director of the largest AIDS research and treatment center in the, on the African continent. And more than that, uh, he's a, a stalwart activist in the struggle for access to medicine. Uh, he's written the best book on the topic, in my opinion, Genocide by Denial. And in addition, he uh, personally risked his freedom by smuggling generic drugs into Uganda from India. And by doing so, uh, essentially forced to open the blockade Zaki of drugs Smith, to Africa. Zaki Smith did the same thing, did he not? Zaki Ahmad. Uh, uh, Zaki Ahmad, he did yeah. smuggle drugs. Well, in. Zaki Ahmad uh, uh, smuggled drugs from Thailand and other places into South Africa, and he was also uh, face, facing arrest. The, the difference being that a country like South Africa has much more powerful uh, drug companies than Uganda did, and a much more powerful government. The thing was that in Uganda, our character, Peter Mujini, had a lot more legitimacy than the actual government. So if they had thrown him in jail, they risked a revolution in their country, and he knew that very well. That's the thing that enabled him to smuggle low-cost drugs into the country with a certain degree of confidence that he would prevail. But for activists here, it's quite moving to see the activism in Africa. Uh, the color of the faces are different, but the, but, the, but the essence of what they're fighting for is the same as activists here in the United States. Definitely. One of the things that was sort of surprising to me was that there was absolutely no mention of homosexuality or gay people as targets or trans being responsible for the spread of AIDS or HIV. And I wondered why there was nothing in the film about that. It was a choice. Yeah, well, actually, you know, earlier versions of the film uh, delved into that. A couple of our characters are openly homosexual, and uh, and you know they're very proud about uh, you know their their uh, their the judge and Zaki. The judge and Zaki, yes. And uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, I found it annoying during the making of the film when even some of my crew people that I'd hired in various countries sometimes ask, "So how did that person get HIV?" You know, and I, I started to think like, why? Nobody would ask that if the person had cancer. You know, for me, that's irrelevant. You know, now obviously there are a lot of issues of stigma and what have you, but that wasn't the topic of our film. The topic of our film was human rights and access to medicine and the right to health. 
And so it became important to me to show everybody in our film as being a human being first and not categorize them in any particular way. And to say, and it was very important to me also to enter the lives of our of our contributors and our characters, show them in their home cooking, mother bathing her daughter, people shopping for food, people going about their daily work, just like you and I do. And not build up barriers between people. Because what I often find is when journalists go to places like Africa or India, uh, you know, they, they tend to they tend to favor exotic images which put up barriers between people. So, you know, the natural reaction that many would have, whether they say it or not, is, well, okay, you could give them the drugs, but look how they live. It's a squalor. I mean, you're almost not doing them a favor by saving them from such a life. You know, we wanted to show the real life that people live in these countries, the fact that it's just like the life you and I live. They deserve every bit as much as, as we do, you know, and, and, and that was the, the driving element of the film. In your film, there's a criticism of first world activists of not really caring about third world uh, people with AIDS or HIV. Uh, that's not how you phrased it. That's how I interpreted it. And I was, uh, I would like you to talk a little bit more about that. Because I think that that's a very important <coughs> question for first world people to think about. Well, uh, you know, I think there's a moment in the film that um, uh, you know, we introduced one of our characters is Jamie Love, an intellectual property activist from Washington. And, you know, I think anybody who's been around the, uh, the issue of access to medicine uh, for a long time in this country will acknowledge that Jamie was somebody that had a very hard time building a coalition at the beginning of his work uh, to make people understand that this is a problem that could be dealt with uh, and that the main issue here was price and, and, and monopoly. And there were not, at the beginning, a lot of receptive people, either in the activist community, or in the political community, or even among human rights groups that had nothing to do with HIV. I think, you know, generally speaking, even in the medical community, you know, the prevailing attitude was, you know, this was not going to be possible. It's not going to be possible because the price would never come down to what it would need to be. And secondly, people honestly didn't believe that medical treatment of HIV could work in Africa. And that was, a, that was a prevalent view even in the medical community. And Peter Mojani from Kabbalah will say even in the African medical community, many had, many had that view. So there wasn't a big drive. Like these, these people won't take their pills in the, at, the, at the proper times that they're supposed you to know, take the thing was, you have, you have to remember, the context of taking antiretrovirals in a country like the United States, where people were taking patented medicine, often where the constituent drugs of their combinations were patented by different companies, competing with one another, right? Now what you had in a place like India is that you have a generic company with the ability to combine those drugs into a single pill, making, uh, you know, for example, a combination drug from Cipla, one pill twice a day initially, now it's one pill once a day, you know, far more easy proposition for people in resource poor settings than taking 10 or 20 pills at different times of day, some with food, some without food. That's what Americans had to do, they had to take all those pills because there were no combination drugs at that time. And, you know, it's not such a big leap for them to think, wow, how is somebody who maybe is illiterate, maybe maybe doesn't, uh, you know, have the ability to uh, you know, have a hygienic setting for taking their drugs, uh, you know, is... is That's stereotyping. True, but, you know, it's not such a leap to say, how the hell are they going to be able to take all these drugs? Not realizing, because of the patent system, they actually had an inferior, uh, uh, you know, therapy in this country, whereas in a country like India, where those patent barriers weren't there, they could actually make combination drugs, which were very easy to take, and very easy to remember when to take, because it's really after breakfast and after dinner, twice a day, one pill. So. My last question has to do with uh, being informed and yeah. making choices about, this is a person, an individual who has been diagnosed with AIDS or with HIV. Right. And there's a, a, a new government policy in the United States, and we're talking to Peter last night, it seems to be a, a position that he thinks is the best one, which is test and treat, test and treat, which is test for HIV, and then give them medicine. Uh, he also proposed something that has just been proposed here, that we take risk populations, healthy people, and treat them with these very strong drugs prior to them getting sick so they can stop the, the flow of, 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 of HIV or of, of sickness. Uh, as you know, there are 
around the world are people that are demonized, but who say don't accept that as, as that paradigm as a way to look at AIDS. And so, in some ways, your film doesn't doesn't none of that question is in the film, and it becomes an endorsement of test and treat. Uh, and I don't know if, if when you made your film. Of the, this new policy of treating healthy people with these drugs. So, to make a long sort of yeah. uh, preface, um, how do you feel about the giving of these drugs to healthy people? Uh, you know, I think that's really a medical question, to be honest. My, my uh, very strong opinion is that there should be the possibility to do that if medical practitioners feel that's the right course of action. You know, so uh, I'm, I'm very much an advocate of access and choice. You know, I know that this debate is raging, and I'm not qualified to make a, a you know a call on that because I know that very very people I have great respect for and uh, you know highly credentialed people on both sides of the argument. However, you know I think that the ability to do that should be there. You know, for countries, and I think you know if if the, the decision is made whatever high level, that this is a way to save lives, this is a way to, you know, stop the spread of the HIV virus, uh, it should be done, and, and, and that possibility should be there. Your career, this is your first feature, it's a feature documentary, yeah. has been with some of the best narrative filmmakers yeah. in the world, and I wondered how you came to making your first film a documentary rather than a narrative, maybe a narrative to engage feature, but a yeah. narrative feature. Well, you know, it was interesting. I, I had a film ready to go when I started this project. Uh, it was a narrative film. Uh, I had uh, written it with a, a well-known director in India. Uh, we had the money in place. Basically, had scouted our locations and begun casting. So we hadn't hired the full crew, but we were on the verge of going into prep on the movie. And, uh, you know, I was very much uh, of the mind that that would be my first movie. But in the meantime, I'd been doing a lot of thinking about this issue and the story and talking to people and reading about it. And I literally woke up one day and I said, no, I have to do this one. Because it's going to be lost. I can't wait two years. I can't wait you two years to do the interviews. And there's no way I'm going to have time in the next two years if I do my movie. So I thought it would take me less than two years. It took it's take me a lot longer than that. But oh, that's well. the reason. It's been five and a half years now since that day. Uh, that but, sounds like a documentary. Though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, I mean, it was, uh, it, it, it was a conscious decision because I knew that movie could wait, but this one couldn't. And that's why I did this one. I would like to go back to a question I asked earlier. The, the Indian uh, pharmaceutical uh, head who decided to do away with profit yeah. to distribute the generics. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about him and what he represents in sort of Indian culture? Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I know Dr. Hamid very well. Uh, His name is? Dr. Yusuf Hamid. And, uh, you know, I have immense respect for him. And to, and to be totally honest, uh, I actually feel his role in this story is much bigger than we make it in this film. Uh, you know, it, and the reason for that is because I wanted this film to be about the coalition of people that came together, and I do believe that's what happened. Uh, but, you know, personally, I would say, without Dr. Hamid, none of this happens. Because it was almost certainly going to have to be an Indian that did it because of the patent set up in the world. And there is no other Indian like Dr. Hamid that I know of, uh, at least not one with the capability. You needed somebody with the, with, the, with the inclination and the ability to do it. And there is only one man that fits those two categories. Uh, so he's a very special person. Uh, his father was a, was a disciple of Gandhi, worked very closely with Gandhi, set up Sipla at the, at the instructions of Mahatma Gandhi. You know, it was never intended to be a, a, a for-profit business in that sense. It was always intended to be a socially-minded business that served the needs of the country and helped India become self-reliant, which was the key message of Gandhi's whole you know, uh, independence movement, the self-reliance, what we say, Swaraj in India. So, you know, there are very strong parallels with the salt march that India, that uh, that Gandhi, uh, you know, undertook in 1930 to basically break an imperialistic monopoly situation on salt, an essential good for the population. You know, this is almost a one-to-one -one parallel of what happened at that time, and none of this happened by accident. These things were very consciously undertaken. Likewise, when Zaki Ahmad boycotted the antiretroviral, 
he was following the template of Mahatma Gandhi in doing that. It was an act of civil disobedience. Importing the drugs into Uganda, importing the drugs into South Africa, was an act of civil disobedience along the lines of Gandhi. None of this happened by accident. And, and he's a capitalist. And he's, he's a, you know, in India, I think a lot of people feel if you want to get things done, you have to be self-sufficient. You can't rely on the government. So I think that if you ask Dr. Amin, he'll tell you he has to make a profit on the non-essential products that he makes. He makes products for erectile dysfunction, hair loss, uh, diet pills, he, he, all these kind of things. He happily makes those, he happily makes a profit on them. But the core mission of the company is not that. The core mission of the country is to serve the health needs of people in India and make the sure there is people, access the to medicine. Poor people. Yes. To make sure that the average Indian and the, uh, and the underclass Indian uh, has the most affordable drugs in the world. Well, I hope that your film doesn't get just boxed into being an AIDS film or an HIV film. I hope so too. I think it, that's a very essential part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. But right now in the United States, uh, with our health care delivery system, even with the Obama health care plan, the pharmaceutical companies won that argument. And I think it's very relevant to middle class and poor people about why we have to pay so much money yeah. when and so much profit is made yeah. that doesn't care about access. Which is what your film to me is about access, generics, yeah. and, and making health care delivery available to all status of the society. I think, you know, at its core, the film is about humanity. And, uh, you know, we have certain obligations to one another on this planet. And I think, you know, it's interesting, something that Joseph Stiglitz said to me, he quoted Thomas Jefferson. And he said, if you think of knowledge as a candle, and you light another candle with your candle, it doesn't diminish the flame on your candle. It just increases, bright it increases brightness around you. But your candle is not diminished. It's not less. Whereas, say, if I took your chair and I said, I'm going to make two chairs out of that, you're not going to get two chairs of equal quality because you've diminished that product, you know? Knowledge is not like that kind of product. Knowledge is something that can be shared without losing anything. You just gain from, from sharing knowledge. And this knowledge belongs to humankind. It's, most of it is taxpayer-generated, taxpayer-funded. You know, these are the fruits of our human culture and our human knowledge, and they belong to everybody. And it's not fair that only 5% of the population of the world can avail of the, the fruits of these the name of the movie is Fire in the Blood, the documentary, and I hope that by the end of the festival that we hear the good news that has been picked up by HBO or one of the companies that will bring it to the public. But I also hope that you will also make it available for people to organize around, uh, because it, 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 it's a beautifully crafted film. It is uh, almost it's like a detective story. It's an adventure film. There are real personalities and heroes and villains in your film. Uh, and I just hope that people will be able to see it that most need it. And that's the people that don't have access in this country yeah. as in other countries of the world. Yeah. Thank we're, you. We're determined that that happens too. So.